Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. Man, we got such a badass guest today We're with Sean McCoyak, also known as, primarily known as Grasshopper. Don't call him <laughs> Sean. I don't want to get any shit for this. Uh, Grasshopper is a lead guitar player and one of the founding members of Mercury Rev. Uh, if you don't know Mercury Rev, they are, these guys are great, man. Uh, like an alt, I hate to label this, but I have to describe, is it alternative? Is that like, is that the best yeah. word? Yeah, okay. Yeah. They're a very, go ahead. I, no, I was gonna say, you know, alternative at the time, like psychedelia, shoegaze. Yeah, right. Okay, like, great. Let's put that in alternative and shoegaze because that's a pretty good alternative psychedelia and shoegaze. These guys write orchestral great, rock. Orchestral rock. These guys write great songs. They're layered text, layered textures. Your your partner, Jonathan, is that his name? Yes, Jonathan. Yeah, he's got a voice, man, like an angel, and Sean knows how to really create total layers of sound in a very beautiful way. And so if you haven't heard of Mercury Rev, I'd encourage you to start listening to them. Uh, a couple of announcements. I want to thank our mutual friend, John Ashton from the Psychedelic Furs. John, thanks so much for hooking us up. Uh, also, make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to the show. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and that little icon the emoji that looks like a bell that helps us get recommended by YouTube. And I appreciate your support on that. Quickly about Grasshopper. Most well-known, as I said, is the founding member, lead guitar player, and multi-instrumentalist for the alternative band. This guy plays like every instrument. Alternative band, Mercury Red. Mercury Revs released 12 studio albums of rich, layered, well-written music. Their album, Deserters Songs, was named Album of the Year in England. Mercury Revs' most recent album. This is a very cool record. It's a reworking of Bobby Gentry's really good album called The Delta Suite. Is it sweetie or sweet? Because it's like a weird spelling. It's kind of a play. Yeah, it's sweet, sweet, but sweetie. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was like a play. Uh, yeah. Grasshoppers from way upstate New York, like almost like Canada, upstate yeah. New York. Um, dude, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to Thanks talking. For having to me. My pleasure, man. It's like you can see he's cold. He's still in upstate New York and it's, uh, you know, beautiful up there, but it is freaking cold. No. Uh, okay. So you have a BA in media studies from SUNY Buffalo and a master's in the same topic from the new school. I was curious what got you into, I guess, making movies. Was that what you were planning on doing? Yeah. I mean, I was, yeah. Uh, soundtracks we were doing, but also I was doing film and, and video and stuff like that. But yeah. And um, what, go ahead. No, I was going to say, yeah. The, so I was interested in all that stuff, and I was like, I was in, I was in theater and stuff like that when I was a kid. So it, it led into that and doing like uh, films and stuff. But then, as I as I got into media study, I found out how expensive film was. Like to make it, to make to film, make it, yeah. to buy the film, to have it developed to do the sound and sync it and everything you you really needed uh some kind of backing or you know you needed money which i didn't have so i i found it so much easier just to like do the music which i was interested in anyway and at that time like the fostex four track recorders and stuff came out or you could get a cheap like i'm looking at one over there like eight track um Tascam, you know, reel to reel, and and the tape was cheap, and you know, it ended up being like a money kind of thing of like to make a film, you have to get all this backing and yeah. get investors and whatever, and you can just make music and kind of like do it pretty cheap, right? So it would be it, you. It, it was like a creative decision almost. Like, where can you be yeah. more creative without having to like check in with others sort of yeah and i you know myself and jonathan we always love the visual things and we're really like film buffs and stuff and film noir and the surreal film and experimental film and everything but the you know the soundtracks were always something that we were really into and creating that aspect of uh, and the sound even the sound foley of the sound effects and the sound and things like Enio Marcone from oh yeah, yeah. and the spaghetti westerns and, and just like I don't know we were 
one flew over the cuckoo's nest the jack nietzsche um soundtrack they just add that so much to those films and the david lynch films and and things like that so you know uh, we just gravitated more towards that because it was like you didn't have to have, be a, like a millionaire to do it you could just make these soundtracks for cheap yeah have you have you guys done movie soundtracks uh we have done a few we've done uh there was this french film we did called uh bye bye blackbird and then they've used our they've used our music in a bunch of a bunch of stuff pumpkin and um well i don't know if i'm supposed to say this now yet or whatever there's sing too which is like you know the film sing it's for kids it's like the animated film for kids no one, so, once your kids are like 18 you hate yeah, anything yeah. to do with kids <laughs> sorry man. but I, like... it, so sing too was supposed to come out you know and then the pandemic happened and stuff so it's on hold but we have we have a couple songs in that so. oh that's awesome yeah yeah because um your music is really lends itself to scores man yeah for sure that's what that's what we were uh that's what we were into at the beginning. It's kind of trying to do film scores and, and, and uh, we did stuff for student films and for local television in Buffalo. You know, that's how we kind of started it is, is uh, Jonathan and myself and Dave Baker were kind of make, making these, uh, making all of these soundtracks for, for films and stuff in TV. I can see that, man, because your music really very much lends itself to it. And it's so, uh, you know, it's like a journey, sort of. A lot of your stuff is very, you could just kind of like float into it, you know? Like, I, I think I have a question later about how, uh, you know, Deserters, the, the next album right after that was, sorry. Uh, All His Dream. All His Dream. Yeah, and it flows. I listened to them back to back, and it was like, oh, it's almost like that was side two, All His Dream. It's just right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really Those cool. Two, yeah. It, it really it could have cool. been a double record or something. Or yeah. It was, Easy. It was. Yeah. It's. It was very. It was very wild to listen to it because I had to check it. I was like, I think this is the next track, but it sounds like side two to Deserter song. You know. Yeah. Um. And a lot of our fans and stuff. When I, I when we play in England and stuff, which you know we've always been like really popular in england and in ireland and uh yeah people are like oh you know i forget if that song's on all his dreamers deserters because there was a time in my life those three or four years where it all that was those two records were kind of like the soundtrack of my life yeah so yeah it's good stuff they, man you know they connect all right so i have no idea if this is true but <laughs> this may be the funniest one of the funniest things in 800 interviews, actually, uh, it, according to Wikipedia, <laughs> this is, I don't even know if I could look at you and like not cry. Uh, you worked as a medical research subject. And this is the quote that they attribute to you. I did this thing at a medical school where I got paid <laughs> to take various drugs they were developing. You're in this controlled environment for three days. And they give you all these drugs and then suddenly stop and watch you suffer. Is that true? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I did that. All right. How did you get that gig? And tell me some funny stories about this thing. Cause it's okay. Hilarious. So it started out, I was in Buffalo in the media studies department <laughs> and uh, you have to take, when you're in media studies, you have to take other gen ed classes or whatever it's stuff in psychology sociology classes so i was taking some psychology classes and the professor said you know if anybody wants to earn extra money you can do these psychology experiments and um uh, so i went and you got paid maybe like 50 dollars, and you would like put this thing on your head and watch like these lights and have to hit like these beepers when you saw lights go in different places or whatever so that was like w one thing then sort of once you get into that circuit of, uh, of sorry about that. All good, man. Once you get into that circuit, it's like uh, it's like anything else it, where you meet other 
people who are like they're, they're like that's how they make all their money that's they're like lifers of like going to different experiments so you meet these other people when you go to do your experiment they say oh you can earn like 50 bucks if you give blood you can earn 50 bucks at this place if you go and you know they'll give you a drug trial Holy and God. so uh so then we got into this that whole world of like and it, it was myself and jonathan were kind of doing it we were given blood and then there was other trials where you would do like these uh, pharmaceutical trials and they would give you those, those drugs and, for like three days and cut you off and just see what your side effects, and you get paid, you know, like $500 and stuff. So it was like another way to just make money. And back then in Buffalo, like $500. Yeah. So like, that was like being a millionaire. I mean, yeah. absolutely. You're a college chicken student. Back Hell yeah. In the 90s, chicken wings were like 10 cents a piece and beer <laughs> was 50 cents. So if you had $500 from one of these experiments, like you could pay your rent for six months and you know, live <laughs> like a king. So we were doing that for a little while. But then, you know, after... I don't know. We did it maybe for six or seven months. And uh, kind of like, I don't know. I don't know if this is like <laughs> taking these weird experimental drugs, if it's like such a healthy thing to keep doing. That's like some and... Jacob's ladder shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. What? Yeah. What? What? Uh, so, what was the weirdest thing, like side effect or, exp you know, like, did they tell you what you were taking or it was just, hey, product A? No, no, it, they didn't. They didn't really tell. Uh, they said some were like painkillers or anti-anxiety or anti-seizure medicine. <laughs> hey, man, do you have Things seizures? Like no, and then, take this anti-seizure medicine. <laughs> they also said, you know, half the group would be on a placebo. Oh, uh, okay. Half of you will be on it. So you didn't really know if until you didn't know at the beginning, but then after a couple of days, you knew because you'd kind of like like be going through withdrawal or flipping out a little bit really so then yeah and then i mean they treated you well if you if that was going on and you went in they they uh they treated you for that right they just wanted to see the effects and stuff like that first so holy you, shit <laughs> you're like a fucking rhesus monkey from, what the heck? what <laughs> i've never met anybody that is there anything that you did that like years later is like, holy shit, when you like were experimenting with drugs or something, you said, oh my God, this is something like what I took back at school. Right now. I'm, no. <laughs> right now, <man. laughs> right no I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. That's wild. You know, like years later, you think. And you go, you go to the doctor and they're like, oh, your cholesterol is high or something. You're like, did that come from something I, yeah, some stupid thing I did in my 20s to make 500 bucks? Or, I, know. I don't know. And all of us would have done it. I would have done it if I was, when <laughs> someone presented 500 bucks. Yeah, I'll fucking take some drugs. I'm taking them anyway, like for free. Right. What the hell? <laughs> wow. But now as a parent, yeah. think about, imagine like your kids, like, hey, dad. I have an opportunity to make a lot of money. Like, wouldn't you freak out if, if you're one yeah. of your kids? <laughs> oh my God. Oh, Holy yeah. crap. Yeah. Oh my God. That is wild, man. Well, I'm glad you survived that. You were, were you literally under lockdown with them like overnight and stuff? You would be. Yeah. Well, you would sign a thing and be in lockdown for, you know, 24, 48 hours. Wow. That's wild. Like, you know, I mean, you weren't, you were in lockdown as far as like, if you, if you freaked out or something wanted to leave, you could. Okay. But you know, it was the, you would lose your getting paid and stuff like that. If you left or like, uh, or treatment, you know, if you had a seizure or anything like that. So you kind of like, if you signed up, you stayed and yeah. And did it. Was it decent accommodations or like you in like some hospital bed or something? It, yeah, it was a hot, but it was, it was nice. It, yeah. It was like a hospital bed and stuff, but it wasn't like uh one flew over the cuckoo's nest. It was more, it was, you know. <laughs> Nurse ratchet didn't come in. <laughs> and nice were, you, were you and Jonathan hanging out this, or do you have to be isolated? No, isolated. Yeah. Oh, wow. We didn't really. That makes know. it tough as well. Yeah. Cause if you're both freaking out, 
you could at least the shared experience, you know, remediates any anxiety. Like in a communal, communal yeah. space or something. But now that it, yeah, now you're in your room and you were like sequestered there. Wow. Pretty much. That's wild, man. That's one of the most interesting stories in 800 interviews I've heard. <laughs> that is pretty wild, man. Wow. Uh, all right. How did you, how did you first get started in the music business and what was your first break? Oh, I started playing, you know, I played instruments from when I was a little kid. Like, um, uh, I, I'm half, I'm half Polish American and half Sicilian American. So my lots of I'm dinners both sides of the family. What's that? Lots of dinners, lots of big dinners. That's a good, that's a good food. Lots that's of good Catholicism. Food. <laughs> lots of Catholicism. <laughs> um, oh, that's so funny and so true. <laughs> but lots of music and lots of like fun time and drinking. Yeah. And good food and good holiday periods. And But uh, yeah, so my, my, on my Polish side, I had my uncle played accordion and stuff. And I would, I would, I played clarinet from when I was a little kid. So we would play polka music together. And then on the other side of my family, you know, in the Sicilian side, we had, you know, some of the old guys, my uncles and stuff played mandolins and mandolas. And then I'd play clarinet with them. And they, that's when I started first playing. Like I didn't play guitar till i was maybe like 18 but i played ukulele mandolins and things like that Mandolin's a hard open, instrument man That's open great. tunings we did open tunings a lot it's still tough man it's not an easy yeah. instrument so it was like so i got into this whole open tuning thing uh, which then when i got into like delta blues and texas blues it was like all uh, like lightning hopkins or sun house you know it was a, like a lot of open tunings and stuff. And then, sure. then I got into then like no wave, like, uh, like Glenn Bronca and, and Sonic youth and stuff. And that's like open tunings, but different open tunings, but I got the whole concept of that. So in my earlier years, I, I, I kind of knew like all the cowboy chords and stuff, but I was playing a lot in open tunings. And how did you, when did you start playing on your own, like away from your family? Um, in my teen, you know, and in the teenage years I started, I was, I started in a band, but I was, I was playing drums first. I started playing drums because I also, when I was like a teenager, I played in a drum corps. Oh, wow. That's so, cool. Yeah. You do the marching like. And this is in Buffalo? Yeah. Uh, in Dunkirk, which in is Dunkirk. which is Dunkirk, Fredonia. It's it's about thirty five miles west of uh, Buffalo, it's between Buffalo and Erie. My buddy's a lives in Buffalo, and he's a massive Bills fan. So he oh, was yeah. down he was down here like a week before the game, and he goes, "Look, we're out to dinner with like his wife, my wife." He goes, "Look." I need you to do me a favor. I was like, what do you go? And he pulls out a Buffalo shirt, a t-shirt. He goes, can you please wear this during the game? Because I just feel we need as much mojo as possible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. It was such a miracle to get the bills there, man. Oh, yeah. It's a thing. I mean, it's like, it's a, it's a thread that brings everybody together. It's, you know. Yeah. Between, you know grandfathers grandsons wives grandmother you know everybody it's like a community thing yeah, yeah. it's like go bills and it's like it's the thing it's it's the thing that bought it's the glue yeah i know it's a big thing in buffalo yeah uh okay so you started playing bands now dunkirk is like way west as we just said is there yeah. a music scene there or did you just travel a lot well, there was kind of a music scene there because um, SUNY Fredonia is like a music college and oh, they yeah. have a huge uh, music program and recording studio and stuff there that's like top notch. Oh, cool. And also there, 
you know, when I was in high school, bands would come there to do like a uh, show before their tour started. So I saw like the tubes. I saw Lou Reed. I saw, I saw Lou Reed. Lou Reed there with cool. Robert Quine. Wow. He, favorite guitar. Yeah. Great player. Great guitar player, man. I love, I love Robert Quine. He's one of my heroes. I saw that. I was, I don't know how old, I was 15 or whatever. Um, yeah, the tubes, Lou Reed, Joe Jackson played there, Robin Hitchcock. Um, Asia played their first show in America there, like a warm up show. Really? But I saw cool. like all that stuff, like right half a mile from my house, you know? Wow. At SUNY Fredonia. So there was all that going on. And, and people don't realize, like, you know, it's actually, you know, Dunkirk as the crow flies, Toronto is only like 60, 70 miles across Lake okay. Erie. So you get all the television stations and radio stations and everything from Toronto. And so there's a lot of like, shows there too, isn't it, Toronto? Oh, yeah. 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 That's very cool. So you so you were able to thrive as a band early on without having to leave that area, that region necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's really cool. A lot of bands from Buffalo, they just play like that circuit of Western New York and Toronto and stuff, and they never leave. You know, yeah. that's all they want to do. And they make they make a living and stuff, you know. Yeah. That's yeah. why I went to uh Binghamton for a couple of years, a year, I think. That but it's not that far. I don't think it's that far west though. Or, no. or north. Or north. Binghamton's like kind of between I, right now I live in the Hudson Valley and okay. it's kind of like it's it's not it's like, totally halfway, but it's about halfway. Yeah. Due west of you. Yeah. 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 I think Binghamton's kind of like under Syracuse if you go yep. down. Yeah. Yep, it sure is, but quite a ways. Yeah. Um, all right. So another thing, I don't know if this is true or not but I read that you moved to a monastery in Spain for six months. That I went to a monastery, but that has been, uh, that story has been <laughs> like exaggerated through the press when, all right, let's get the real skinny here, man. So, you know, you know how the, uh, the British press loves to uh, exaggerate things or, you know, Do they? Embellish a little bit, but I, I did go to a monastery, but it was only six weeks and it was out here near Rochester, New York. And then s somehow, you know, through the, through the stories or whatever, they embellished that to six months and in Spain, in Spain, <laughs> which I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. But I did, I did go to a monastery. It was just like a retreat kind of thing. Uh, it was just like, a, it was a thing for me in that time of my life where I just, I just wanted that time. And it was a monastic kind of thing. And you just did chores and it was, but it, it was six weeks. Uh, it was not six months or something. Oh, <laughs> so, how so how was, old were you when you did that? Uh I was, I think I was like 29, 30. Oh, okay. So you were like an adult already. Yeah. So it was like a deliberate thing. It wasn't like, like the, uh, Hey, let's go and get paid 500 bucks to take no, away no, loots no. for three days or something. Yeah. This was like an intentional deliberate thing Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to unwind or something probably. Yes. Oh, cool. How was that? It was very great. It was cool to sort of empty the mind. Yeah do something different you had your chores and stuff but you also had a lot of time to think and to uh reflect on your life and you know even though it was six weeks you know for some six six weeks is a long time for, it was it's a it, it is a cake. hey man if you're never used to slowing down yeah and you're never yeah, well yeah today in this world it's and, yeah it was six like, weeks uh, is forever yeah, it was and a great, know, great experience. Um, I've, I've studied self, I always try to be better. I've studied self-development stuff for a long time. And just the act of taking time to think, you know, we all don't really do that. We just react. But when you take some quiet time, even 10 minutes, man, at night, just to say, hey, how am I going to approach this? It, I, I know for me, it's like really 
like cathartic, man, just to, oh yeah, you know, do nothing. I've still, I've done it a few times since then. Not as long though. I've done a week and two weeks at the Buddhist monastery. There, there's a few of them around where I live now, in the Hudson Valley and the Catskills. Sure, there's a there's a few of them, and um, you just go on like a week retreat and. Uh, you can do a silent thing. You can do a thing where you're just going, you know, listening to different speakers and um, people from Tibet or India, and and it's just kind of a nice time out. Yeah, reset. I'm gonna stay in touch with you. I'm gonna find, once your kids hit the teenage years, you'll be booking that shit. Like <laughs> 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 you'll have a, a a wing named after you in that place. <laughs> Every six months. I know I could have used that with my kids who are all teenagers. <laughs> well, that's good, man. That's really good. I think it's important to get some downtime once in a while, man, and clear your shit up. Oh, yeah. Um, all right. Let's talk about deserters songs. Uh, if what I read is accurate, and if it's not, please tell me. This was kind of like a last chance record for you guys. It was almost expected to be your farewell. But you crushed it. And you basically turned your entire destiny around it, the, the record established you in England and Europe, increased your popularity here in the States. Um, for, is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Uh, I have some questions. I mean, we were pretty popular in, in the UK before that, uh, but it, it, it was more mainstream popularity there than like before in the UK, we were like a cult band or whatever. But then when deserter songs, it was like when I would go there and I'd go to the supermarket and we'd be playing at Sainsbury's, which is like, yeah, I know <laughs> my yeah. wife's from there, man. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we'd hear our songs like, you know, and, right on the, on the speaker and the, that's yeah. pretty, that's pretty cool. And we'd be like in a black cab and we hear our song, you know, on the BBC different you know bbc one bbc two you know how did that feel on, first time so it was that. like wow it's uh, you know jumped to another level that's really great man it's a great record so i mean it's not a surprise and listen to it um i want to ask you some questions to whatever extent you're comfortable answering them and i apologize i know some of these questions you've probably been asked before so i'm I hope this will be the only um questions i'll ask you that you heard a thousand times uh, talk about some of the issues that you guys were having prior to working on this record, which led people to think this was going to be your farewell or your swan song. Um, it was, um, uh, we just partied a lot and we <laughs> on the road and, um, it was just internal problems of fight, you know, some fighting and direction and, you know, we the record before that see you on the other side we really loved and we put everything into it and um it just didn't go anywhere so we were discouraged kind of by that yeah um and i that's one of my favorite records and jonathan's also and it's just one of those it i think it was just a thing that it, it was at the wrong time it just wasn't re you know received it was different than what was going on it was like Britpop was happening and this was this other weird thing that we were doing. And so it didn't connect then. And then a lot of that same vibe we did on Deserter songs, but used more violins and stuff in, in, and uh, orchestration. And I don't know, it just, for some reason it just hit then, you know, a couple of years later. Um, and so we didn't expect it and we were pretty flabbergasted, but also, you know, we loved it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> when you do something and people connect with it and you feel like you're doing, you know, something that's communicating. Yeah. And then it just makes it all the better. Even the money and stuff like that doesn't matter. It's more like that 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 thing of where people come up come up after you play or even now years later now it's been you know and they say that record really resonated with me at that time i still i played it 
when my baby was being born in the hospital, we had it playing or, that's you know, so cool. We, we had so many stories. That's really cool. That's why you do it. You know? Yeah. Well, it validates you too, you know, for when you, yeah. especially music, you, you, it's a very vulnerable thing. You're opening yourselves up and it's like, man, how much, you can't give blood as well. Right. You know, I mean, what do you, you know, well, I did, I did I gave blood. <laughs> $50, uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, but, yeah, yeah, that's, that's so cool. Um, and now you guys have known each other forever too, right? Yeah. 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 That's gotta be tough. Uh, and I'm not saying anything negative for anybody. I mean, you know, you know, somebody that long <laughs> and you're, Oh, it's like a marriage almost, you know, you're with 24 seven. It's, it's, you got to, work shit out it's not easy man you know yeah yeah I mean, for sure yeah. yeah yeah for christmas jonathan got two pairs of these uh sony like head they're like uh, noise canceling headphones it's like when well, we don't want to hear each other we can like cancel <laughs> cancel it out <laughs> so is that the thing like when you're with each other you put the headphones on it's like it's like when you're in college you put a note on the door like don't come in tonight <laughs> yeah like give me an hour yeah, we Give me an hour. Up. I'm going to listen to uh, Ineo Maracone. There you go, man. <laughs> uh, so uh, for Deserter songs, Garth Hudson and Levon Helm from the band contributed to that record. How did you connect with them? And, and what, what's a good memory or an experience about working with them? So we were big band fans. And when, uh, well, so Jonathan is is from this area. He grew up in a little town, Hurley, near here. Okay. And um, so that's why we kind of ended up here after we were both in Buffalo. Um, he grew up here. I grew up in Buffalo, but then we ended up here. And then, um, you know, the band, the guys were right in Woodstock. Right. Which is very close. And they, I live in Kingston, New York. And... You'd see like Rick Danko, or you'd see Levon getting his hair cut. That's and wild. we got to know those guys. And uh, so we just asked, um, at the time, our friends, a couple of our friends were recording them. And we just asked, you know, if they would want to play on a couple of songs that we were doing during Deserter songs. And they said yes. And so it was like, it was pretty awesome. Um, it was amazing that they said yes and came in and played just to meet them and the stories and everything. Yeah. So talented, those guys, man. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you know, Rick, Rick never, Danko never played on our stuff, but we, you know, we were kind of friendly with him. He was actually, he was going to play on um, all his dream on a few songs. He was going to play bass. Uh, but he he passed away like right around the time we started recording right. it. so yeah and this was this recorded up in up in the kingston area the hudson valley area yeah yeah okay yeah cool. and around woodstock and kingston yeah but then we mixed it all in uh dave fridman's which is out near where i grew up in uh in buffalo okay that's where his his place is out there tarbox Okay. studios so that's out there and he's done a lot of dave fridman's done like you know the flaming lips the flaming lips yeah mgmt and mogwai and a bunch of stuff that's cool man uh I, I love i love that i'm a fan of that record um you know got us on a highway of course endlessly the funny bird man that's got such a cool funky bass groove what what is that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I love the bass on there. It's a really, re and it's the 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 engineering on that record is like perfect, man. It's so freaking yeah. well done. Who who's playing bass on there? Or what? That's Dave Fridman. Yeah, that was great, man. That whole yeah. So I I met Dave Fridman when I was in high school, and uh, I played in a band with him. Um, it was it was a band that I had with a few friends called the People's Front, 
Great. And what it was what a great from, name for a, like a punk alt band. Yeah, like, it was taken, but it was also it came from a Monty Python from Life of Brian. <laughs> it was uh, in Life of Brian. There's this group called the People's Front of Judea. It was just like you know this weird anarchist group. Or whatever. So we thought it would be fun to take that name. So that was the name of the band. Our bass player left, and I met Dave Fridman, and he he started playing bass with us for some shows. And then he got a scholarship at Fredonia for the Tone Meister program to start recording, the, you know, do a, uh, uh, through the program there to get his degree, you know, in, in, in sound engineering. And uh, so then I had introduced him to the Flaming Lips and to Jonathan and stuff. So then um, that's how they started using him okay and and we used him obviously when we did our first album your self-esteem that was his uh senior project really so that was like yeah dude that record is great i mean you got chasing a bee frittering uh very sleepy rear i love that record yeah. to be honest with you. i thought it was awesome yeah so that was like that was us all learning and day that was like dave's first record he kind of did and stuff he was it's, learning and it's pretty damn good for his first record yeah man. we I were just experimenting you. and going out like see how we could like screw it all up and do things <laughs> our own way and did it great learn as we went uh in in that record deserter songs i hear a lot which sounds like a theremin but I know that you also made a device called, I think it's the TEDx wave yeah. accumulator. Is that, mm -hmm. what is that? Is that a Thurman or is that this device? That's actually neither. What is it? <laughs> That's a bowed saw. A bowed so, saw. Yeah. It's holy. Let me tell you that holds a lot of those songs together. Yeah. It's amazing that that hanging out there in the background, I mean, I couldn't believe it. it. It just puts the whole song together, man. We met this guy, Joel Eckhouse is his name, and he lives in Portland, Maine. And we had, we took up a bunch of the songs and uh, I'm looking at the tape machine over there. We, it was a Tascam 16 track. We loaded that up in the car. It had like the tracks on it. We went up there with a couple microphones and uh, we drove to Portland and had him play on a bunch of stuff with the uh, boat. So Port saw. Portland, Oregon or Portland, Maine? Portland, Maine. Oh, okay. Portland, Maine. So, you know, it was a why it was a ways, but not, not as bad as Portland. Not Oregon. as bad as Portland. Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. We drove up there and, uh, you know, eight hours or whatever, recorded him for about a day, just playing stuff. And then, uh, you know, when we brought it to Fridman, we edited it in and out, you know, made it fit. But yeah, that's, it does sound, because it has the wavy sound, it sounds like a theremin. Like, yeah. It, yeah, it's, it's the bowed saw. It, literally and, a saw? Yeah. It's a saw, but it has like the teeth are filed off, so it's just, um, it's like a straight saw. There's no that's teeth on the one end. And you use a violin bow and the longer the saw, the better. And you bend it and bow it and it goes. That's it amazing. Sounds like, it sounds like a theremin. I don't even normally like a theremin, but in this, th it's just, it, it really is like perfect. Like I don't, I was, I don't know how. Yeah. The thing it. with the bow saw, it's like more organic and it's with the bow and everything. It can almost. I don't know. It sounds like a human voice almost. Yeah. Like a, like a singing kind of thing. That's why, yeah, the name, the singing saw, that's, I think, where that came from is, you know, from old folk recordings and stuff where it was an instrument that was used. Very cool, man. I, I, that's really interesting. Uh, I, I asked you earlier, and was that about how if you listen to uh, all is dream which is the record right after deserter songs mm -hmm. does sound like side two of deserter song or the second you know double record was that done intentionally um not really i mean we were on that roll of we had done deserter songs 
And then a, a bunch of those songs on All His Dream, we kind of wrote when we were on tour, like in sound checks and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was in that spirit of of playing the of playing those songs from Deserter Songs that those songs were written out of. So I think it was like an extension of of that. Okay. Yeah. It's a great record, man. Uh, I want to talk about Thanks. your last record, the Delta Sweetie. You took Bobby Gentry's record, which is the Delta Sweet or Sweetie, and you created totally new arrangements. And then you had a yeah. different female artist singer do each track. Uh, first thing is that record has like an interesting history and a bit of a mystique to it. If you could talk about that and also what you found so compelling about it to redo it. Is this a big project? Yeah, it's like, it's one of those records, I think both my parents and Jonathan's parents own that we heard, oh. you know, as kids, like in the 70s. Um, and Bobby Gentry, I don't know, it was like, there's this thing about her where she she made these records and then she just quit and disappeared. Yeah. And uh, so there's this mystique and kind of like this cool thing where she did what she did and then she's gone. And, you know, we wonder if she's heard what we did and, you know, but she doesn't really communicate. Have, have uh, you tried reaching her or is she just like totally off the grid? Did, we put out feelers of people, journalists who like kind of knew, but uh, we didn't get any response or anything really other than the, the fact that then after we did that, like they released that record, like in a re, you know, re-release the package of it. You oh, know, that's interesting. After that. So I think like somebody, somebody knew that it was being redone or whatever, but um, yeah, we just, we tried to capture like the Appalachian mountains go from the Delta up to here to the Catskills. And so we had like that connection and we were trying to be like, well, what if kind of like, um, let's reimagine it from uh, this perspective of where we are here and uh, kind of do our own, our own version of that record. How much input did the singers have in creating each particular arrangement and their own melodies? Um, well, we recorded all the music beforehand. Okay. And um, Jonathan sang the songs as a, like, as a kind of a scratch mm-hmm. vocal. But we always wanted, you know, the, I don't know, the main idea was, you know, Jonathan didn't want his vocals to be on there. We wanted to do this thing where we had different singers doing each song so we would send you know we would send some of the singers a couple different songs and see which one they wanted to do okay until like then when a lot of them were filled then um you just said we have this song you would like (laughs) would you like to do it (laughs) do you want to do it or not right (laughs) right on how did you did you know all those gals that that sang on there because you have pretty Pretty, pretty good selection of, of yeah a bunch of them we you know a bunch of them we knew personally and some we were just like fans of and like, right you know their records and stuff so we would we would call our record company bella union and say like can you contact these people and see if they you know want right. to do it and uh but lucinda williams i mean you know we were a big fan you know huge fans yeah. Like Nora Jones. Right. Beth Orton. Beth Orton. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you get to perform with any of them or was it all tracks? So we didn't perform with them, but we got to go to some of the recordings. I mean, Hope Sandoval, that's another, oh my God, Hope Sandoval from Mazzy Star. Yeah. But yeah. She's- we got to go when um, Lucinda did hers. We were there with her in LA. Oh, you did. So you were there for the recording of that. Yeah. That's gotta be, that's gotta be really cool. 
Yeah. And we hung out with her and that was awesome. That was amazing. Um, Vashti Bunyan was actually here. We had asked about her doing a track and um, to, to Bella Union and Simon Ramon, the, the head of the record label was like, actually, I just talked to her and it, weirdly enough, she is like a half an hour from you right now. She's visiting, visiting her sister in Rhinebeck, New York, which is like right across the river from us. So then like within a day, she was here in our studio, like doing it. That's so cool. Recording it. So it was like, wow, that's amazing. You know? Yeah. It's when things are supposed to work out sometimes when that, something like that happens, it's like, yeah, you know, it's like the universe telling you, Hey man, you, you, you're doing the right thing here, man. We're going to set this yeah. up for you. Yeah. That's very cool. When that happens, man. Yeah. That's great. Uh, what were some of the highlights uh, for you in making the, the record? Because it's, and again, another, in, did Dave engineer that record as well? No, uh, Jonathan, myself, and our friend, and uh, our friend Jesse Chandler, who plays with us now, like we did it. it phenomenal. Did it. Fucking incredible, man. I mean, like I would turn up the vote, you know, I, I have like speakers, like I don't uh, like, like old school speakers, you know, like yeah. my kids come in my office all the time. Like, why do you have these big things? They don't get it. Uh, and I just turned everything up and listened to the everything. That mix was so clean on that. When you heard those vocals, man, it was like, holy shit. Really well done, man. Thanks. Yeah, so Peter Cain is, um, was the one who mixed the, uh, the Bobby Gentry. And we have known him for quite a few years. He, he did actually some of the, some, a few overdubs we did on Deserter Songs. In all his dream, we did with him. Um, he, ha he has a studio in Connecticut, Bridgeport, mm. Connecticut. And uh, yeah, but he makes the uh, the Delta Suite uh, record that we did. And he did like amazing job. Yeah. Work like, like with Interpol and the National and stuff like that. Very cool, man. Uh, it's I asked people this question, but with you, I got a lot of curiosity. What was your childhood like? It was pretty happy. Anyway, it was the seventies and it was in Buffalo or Dunkirk. And so it was kind of like, <laughs> it was kind of like the depression <laughs> was still going on almost <laughs> because in the 70s there you know the it, it was the rust belt when it, things were like kind of closing down and stuff like steel mills and stuff steel like mills that. and yeah. stuff were closing down so yeah cuz you are um, in that you are in that rust belt like pittsburgh yeah. ohio yeah. yeah 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 but then also it had like this cosmopolitan feel because like i said you know, we had SUNY Fredonia where these concerts are going on. We had all the television stations from Toronto, like CBC, one, two, three. So you, and then, like, we got cable TV. My dad was one of the first ones. He was like this. My dad was a history teacher. He was just into media, big media and film buff. He, like, was one of the first ones. I think we were, like, the first family that got cable TV. Oh, wow. So then we got all the channels from New York City, like WPIX, WOR and stuff. So then we like felt like, OK, we have Toronto, one of the most populated cities in North America, other than like Mexico City. And we have New York City television. So we felt like, you know, and I like a lot of people who go there now and, and see and go to Tarbox and stuff say, wow, this is like the hinterlands out here. But we felt like we were like these like rootless cosmopolitans. And all <laughs> we had all this culture from Toronto and New York City and stuff on the on the TV. And we had concerts coming in to Fredonia with, you know, and Doc Severinsen would come there and play or Maynard Ferguson or the Duke Ellington Orchestra. So we felt like, uh, you know, we were like. <laughs> it felt like you were happening. We felt Run like it was all happening. 
How Dunkirk, like how far is that from the city? That's got to be like a 12 hour drive or something, no? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like, it's like eight or nine hours. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever get to go in the city or like, cause just for your music, that, that's the place. I didn't, um, I didn't go until I was like in high school, hmm. but my family traveled a lot because my parents were school teachers. Okay. So they both had the summer off and, you know, they had oh. the vacations off. So we traveled a lot, but we never went to New York City. We went to like Chicago, Detroit. We went to Florida and Virginia and, you know, Tennessee and stuff like that. But um, I don't New know. York City is not a place you take small kids, though. Right. right? Exactly. Yeah. It's really. But then, uh, it's, you know, when I was in high school, I really wanted to go. And then I started going. Yeah. It's a great place. CBGBs. Right? Yeah, that whole area is so different now. Oh, yeah. I know. You know. Remember when you go to the Bowery and it was like nothing but homeless people, like in the yeah. late 70s and shit? It was like, now yeah. it's like Fifi. It's just I amazing. Know. It's just amazing. Yeah. I, had a, I had a place recently for like six years on Fifth, right? Fifth and Bowery. Did you really? Yeah, just like a it was uh i had it on the weekends that's awesome man so yeah holy shit what a great location oh yeah and before that i was so i lived on third and b oh from, wow uh from 89 till about 94 95 and i moved was, up here it was still the east village then yeah yeah that's pretty cool man knitting factory yeah. spiral Man, do you know Eric Amble? Eric Amble. He had a bar. He's a guitar player, but he owned a bar in the East Village. He lives in Brooklyn now. He plays with, um, man, I can't bottle, not the Bottle Rockets. Um, he, he was actually Joan Jett's initial lead guitar player oh, wow. uh, before Ricky Bird came in. Um, he had a really popular bar right there, like right near, I think, 3rd and B around there or something like that. Really? So I ask. Yeah. Because there was like 2B. Maybe that was it. I don't know. This great bar at two at second and B. It just was called 2B. That's a great name. <laughs> That's a cool name. So how, what made you move up state? Kids? Having kids? No, I moved before that just to get it's just like the, the money thing of like, you know, you're paying so much rent. Oh my god, yeah. Down there and stuff. And uh so I met this guy. Joe Conqueror, he's a artist and he owns a building up here in Kingston. And I met him at the knitting factory through my friend, John DeVries, who played in a band, Agipop. And they were friends with the replacements and stuff like that. I met him and he said, you know, I've got this building up in Kingston and you guys could have a whole floor for like, you know, 300 bucks a month and put a studio there and live there or whatever wow and so then you know around 1995 ish um we took him up on it and we moved up good for you and jonathan and i like we were on separate sides like i had a bedroom in the front he had a bedroom in the back in the middle like we had a studio like a full recording studio and everything and some of deserter songs we recorded there and, oh that's yeah. so cool yeah 300 we bucks did a demo. month god you can't get a, that you can't get a closet for 300 bucks a month oh yeah in yeah. the worst neighborhood in new york city yeah. so even after that though then like i you, you could buy a house and pay a mortgage of you know like a thousand dollars yeah instead of paying rent for three thousand for a shoebox or something yeah totally yeah but the thing is you know you're so close like I would go to New York every every week. Yeah. Either drive down or you can drive to Poughkeepsie and take the Hudson line down and you're there. Yeah. Yeah. And, That's a and, real popular area now too, that whole Hudson Valley. Yeah. I've spoke to tons of musicians living there. I, and I know I I because I kind of read stuff about New York. I know that it's it's hard to get in there now because it's so crowded with musicians. Yeah. It's yeah. true. That's really cool, man. What a great community to live in though. Yeah, it's great. Uh, 
Grasshopper, what were some of the low points or dark periods you've had to deal with in life and how'd you get through them? Uh, there was low. <laughs> you go through your roll of decks of low points now. I can see them, the pages spinning. <laughs> There's low, I don't know. There's high and low points all the time. There was really low points though before Deserter Songs. Like I had said, when we did, uh, when we did see you on the other side and then it didn't really, nobody got it. It didn't hit. And we put everything into that. So that was like a low point. Um, and that ended up in being like some substance abuse and things like that period too. Yeah. There was that added on top, but then so for a couple of years there, but then, uh, you know, with deserter songs, we sort of climbed out. That was also that time. That was during that time when I went to the monastery. And oh, is that like gotta, part of like your rehab sort of? Yeah. Good for you. And that was and all, all by did, yourself. We, That's- we kind of all did stuff like that and came back together and then, it pretty it, it was real, very healing and cleared the air and stuff and then we basic you know we worked it out through the music and making deserter songs and uh, you know since since deserter songs it's there's still been lows and stuff of you know the grind of touring or things like that but nothing that low that it was before that I mean everything's been pretty great. That's great, man. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. I'm glad that that all worked out, man. Uh, any, if you can go back and give advice to young grasshopper, what advice <laughs> would you have given yourself that might have made life easier? It could be business, professional, relationships, life, whatever, spiritual, whatever, you, whatever would have made your life easier. Uh, don't drive the car so fast. <laughs> freeway. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> on the throughway um, i don't know you know i don't i don't have many regrets and stuff i think everything you learn whether it's right or wrong leads you to a place that you are now and hopefully that's a better place yeah that you, you know you learn so much when you i don't know if you can swear on this can you swear on this oh fuck yeah <laughs> when you fuck up like that yeah <laughs> you you learn a lot i know man you know, it? those fuck ups then lead you to a place where you're more grounded in or you know hopefully and where you don't make the same mistake again yeah tuition is the uh i know the expensive teacher but like that's the only way it seems like you can learn man isn't it <laughs> intuition and tuition nope. intuition and tuition yeah man uh hey let's talk about gear for a few minutes what what is your go-to guitar right now and what other two might round up your top three right now i got this gnl ah uh, okay so what is that's like an offset what is that yep. model called <laughs> So it's a GNL. It's kind of like a jazz, a j- jazz master, master, right? But it has, uh, the, I like the whammy bar on it because it has like, you can pull up and down, but it's like locked in. Okay. And so, you know, I love jazz masters and old Jaguars and stuff, but a lot of times when you're screwing around that the, the bar pulls out or you know, <laughs> whatever, it's, it's just like that floating bridge thing. Is a weirder thing, and this is more like a strat. I always like the strat, um, but you know, tremolo bar, tremolo yeah. system. Mm-hmm. But this, this is like a fulcrum, so it goes up and down. Okay, and it stays in tune. So that's like, is that are those P nineties? Yeah. Well, they're like a special. They're kind of like P nineties, but they're like a special. A cool looking guitar, man. Yeah. Is that ebony or rosewood on the, on the fretboard? That's rosewood. Yeah. I, lo- I love dark woods. Uh, what do you typically play through on tour and in the st- on stage and in the studio? So on stage, 
I play through a uh, Fender Blues Deville. Right on. Live. And in the studio, I play through. Uh, there's a rolling jazz chorus. I have a Vox. I have a couple different Voxes. Did you get any of those in very, England? What's that? Did you get any of those in no, England? No, no. I didn't get them in England. I got them here. Uh, what else? I had, so Go. I also had like a, I have a PV uh, Delta Blues. Delta Blues? Dude, I have one of those right Which, here. I, I love the 15 inch speaker. Well, I have, a, I have one with a 15 inch and I have one with four tens. Oh, wow. That thing must crank. The one with the four, I like the one with the four tens. Yeah, that must. So loud. Yeah. Then also, so we have the ZT, the little ZT lunchbox amps. No, what are those? You know those? No, I don't know. Let me grab one. Yeah. Wait, one second. Yeah, do your thing. Thank you. <laughs> so what is that now? I've never seen that. These are amazing. It's 200 watts. That's 200 watts. It's so loud. Yep. And you can, uh, you can plug it into, you know, you can either just use this or you can plug it into a speaker cap like, uh, and um, I, I forget, what does it do? Like eight ohms. You have to do eight ohms, but yeah, it's, uh, it's 200 watts. And it's the name of the company is ZT. ZT, yeah. And so that little thing cranks out 200. But how, what kind of, how loud does it have to get before that speaker distorts? Because, you know, looking at it, it's a small speaker. You'd think it would break up pretty quick, no? No. You, I'm sorry, no. the, the Zoom. It's like amazing. <laughs> Say that again. The Zoom blocked you out just for that one second. Oh, the ZT? Yeah, yeah, it's you just would... like it's amazing. It's and it's totally clear. It oh, doesn't holy... distort. It doesn't wow. distort. It's just clear, clear as a bell. I'm gonna look in. I've never seen that. That is really cool. I think John Ashton. I think we hooked them up. He got a couple of them, and like Lee Ronaldo from Sonic Youth, Nels right. Klein. Yeah, Nels Klein has a couple. When Wilco was doing sort of that, Wilco was doing that stripped down tour. I think Nels was playing through a couple of those. He's got everything, every device known oh, to yeah. mankind to guitar play. Yeah. He's like yeah. a walking, but he, you know, he's, he's yeah, he's Nels. <laughs> you know, he uses everything so well, you know. He's like, oh man, he's awesome. He's, yeah, he's great. He's had a, a man not to divert but he's had a lot of heavy shit happen to him in his life yeah i didn't know i don't yeah. know about so, yeah yeah on the on the interview he was like i was like you know he's a very quiet unassuming guy he's had a lot of heavy shit i was like whoa oh man it's just wow. interesting you know, it's interesting to hear you know everybody's carrying around the burden right. of 40 50 years of living and nobody gets away unscathed unfortunately you know there's some yeah. degree it's to what degree can you handle it and not freak out i guess you know what that's always yeah. interesting to see that yeah um okay so what so you have the gnl what other two guitars would round out your top three um i love telecasters and but i mostly have i mostly get tellies that have like I, the, my favorite telly is the deluxe plus and it's like known as the johnny greenwood telly the that's two the humbuckers it's, it's got well it has um it has the sensor lace okay one humbucker and one single but when i got mine i pulled the i pulled the sensor lace out and i put in a uh joe barden pickup okay which was like amazing. Joe uh, Barden pickups are like, oh my God. I have to check some of those out because I've had a lot of guys talk really favorably about them. Joe Barden pickups are like, but they're very expensive, but they're like amazing. Yeah. But you know, it's 
so what? You know, you get what you pay yeah. for. You know, you're a fucking professional musician. What are you going to do? Skimp on a pickup? You know? Yeah. That, 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 but the Tele Deluxe Plus was great because it had again, it has a Stratocaster uh, tremolo vibrato bar, mm-hmm. and it also had like the switch for the split pickups, oh, so you okay. could you could make it sound like a single coil or the, you know. The, you could make it sound like a single coil or a humbucker and stuff. So it had so many sounds. I kind of, I retired that guitar because it got, well, you know, I played it for years. I've I had s- it. I saw that. I saw you. It got that lost. Um, it was lost for about two weeks. And then when I got it back, I said, I'm not touring with it anymore. I just, you know, I play it still on uh, recording stuff, but, I, uh, cause I got that in maybe like 1990, 91. And I just, I don't want to lose that baby. Yeah. So I don't, I don't tour with it anymore. Um, uh, I take other stuff. How'd you get hip to G and L? What made you get a G and L? Uh, I'm trying to think a friend of mine had a couple and I played, um, they had like a, they this friend of mine had a telly their version of the telly their version of the strat and i played those and i really liked them and then this came out a couple years ago and i got the the doheny here and yeah i just i love the the whammy the whammy bar the the vibrato you know I've talked everybody that every player I've spoken to that has a GNL loves, it. I mean, loves it, you know, and they say it's better than a fender, but it's such a small population of people that have them. I don't know why, I guess I don't, maybe resale value. I don't know, but musicians aren't thinking about resale value if they find a good instrument. Yeah. I mean, they're, I think, you know, I mean, Leo Fender designed it. Yeah. Stuff, so it's like, it's a good guitar. You they're think. like they're good also the you know some of the uh, music man ernie ball ones want me to bring one of those over yeah yeah, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah let's check that, it out. that was like a okay all right so that's uh that's that's the sterling <laughs> sterling stingray that's the stingray okay so how does that feel or sound different to because it's kind of like a stratty it's like yeah. a strat and an offset had sex yep. and came, that came out. It sounds great. It like the humbuckers are great. And uh, I don't know. I just love it. It's like really light, and really fun to play. And I also like, um, so the tremolo thing on here, you, you can, there's like this handle on here. Oh, yeah. I see that. Instead of using the bar, you can, you can like grab this. Oh, that's cool. With your whole hand and kind of do a bend, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's a neat thing. It's really light. As you get older, you know, 50, 54, 55, you, like these heavy guitars get more, like <laughs> kills, kills your back. So you like look for a nice lighter. I know. I, I think that's the truth, man. <laughs> ain't that the truth? I love I, my 335 is my number one and I have like shoulder issues. So I'm like, God, I'm how can I be dealing with this? Like I, my shoulder hurts if I, this is not pleasant. You know, it's like, you know, how do I, how do I reverse that? And I guess I like that black strat you have back there, man. I love that. That is a, uh, it was, it's a lip, not limited, like a limited edition, but Fender came out with them in like 2015. It's a, it's called a blackout strat. Cause it's like black. Yep. Sparkle. Yeah. And, uh, it's one of the few strats, like the price has gone up on it. I'm not that I'm interested in selling it, but it, it's an ebony fretboard. It's, it feels great. I play it a lot. Yeah. I love that one. I really enjoy it. I have one kind of like a blackout one like that, but it's an HH. So there's two humbuckers. Oh, but it's cool. the same. It's all black like that, but there's two humbuckers instead of the single coil. Hey, let me, let me ask you this. So I got this recently. It's a Japanese. Uh, strat and i wanted an hss so i have a humbucker in the bottom right yeah um and they said it was a 
uh, it's supposed to be a Pete Thorne humbucker, and it was supposed to be like a PF. To me, it's it doesn't sound. It's kind of brittle sounding, right? Nothing against Pete or his you know, or this pickup. Um, right. What would you recommend? Because I want to get another one. What would you recommend I put in here? I like a warm sounding like a PAF. Like I'm a blues player. You want to pull that out? Well, I'm not going to do it. That's way above my. No, no, I, I mean, so. But yeah. yes, yeah. <laughs> That's that what I be, have. I, that would I have be a, like I do. That would be a good idea if I did it. Um, I don't know. I I like this either. I like either the Seymour Duncan. Um, and there's various ones on the website, and I don't know all the names because I have a few different. And then Guitar Fetish. Do you ever get stuff from Guitar Fetish? No. Guitarfetish.com is like amazing. Okay. Guitarfetish.com. I think they're from Boston. They basically cut out the middleman and they make everything and sell it direct. So then because they don't distribute or do anything, they sell it right to you from that website. Like the prices can be, you know, you know are, are lower, but they're like amazing pickups. Okay. And uh, I want to check that. I've got to get something for this. because I just love the guitar. For this. I've never had a Japanese guitar. It's a great, I play that Strat almost all the time. It's oh, yeah. I have a Japanese telly from like the 80s that I got. Um, I saw it in a swap sheet and uh, it was in Albany. And I drove up there and called the guy and he met me in the park. He sold me this Japanese telly, which was amazing. It's like amazing. And I've been offered from um, when I have it set up at like the Luthiers and stuff. The guy has offered me like four grand for it. And so I paid like $400 for it. They're really inexpensive, the Japanese guitars. Yeah. And I don't know. Yeah. And it, that also has like the split coil um, uh, humbuckers and uh, four grand. He said, I'll give you $4,000 for that guitar. I said, nah. Maybe someday, but yeah, that's a, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I love these. I, I'm now I have it like on my reverb, so like I need another one, right? Uh, <laughs> but I have it on just because because you can get some cool colors in the Japanese mod. Like I love uh, uh, not candy apple uh, Fiesta red, and you can't get yeah. that in a Fender unless it's custom. Yeah, but you can get a yeah. Japanese. You like Echo and the Bunny Man at all? Do you know. What? Uh, yeah, I like so. I'm not as familiar. I, I bring on the dancing horses. I love that. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I I bought that Killing record. Moon. Yeah, I was in the. You know, it was like I used to hear them when I'd be in the used records, like in Bleaker Bob's or something like that. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I bought like a couple of EPs, massive singles. Yeah. Like, yeah, you know. So I I'm a little. What what makes you ask? Did, did, did well, because I think Will Sargent, the guitar player, he plays uh, a Jaguar. That's that uh, that color, the Fiat. The Fiesta yeah. Red, yeah, yeah, I love that color, man, with like a mint green uh, uh, p uh, pick guard. That's on my list for one day. Like, Let me show you this guitar. Yeah, man, had re. Uh... All right, so this was a project. Wow, it's a Jag, and I put so those are guitar fetish. Um, like P90s. That's a beautiful guitar. Put in. And then I had that pickguard made. That pickguard is really cool. And then this is like a wilt old. They don't make many of these. You can't find these much. This was put on instead of it had a stop bridge. And I had this. It's a Wilkerson old like 70s. Yeah. So you, you can find these once in a while on eBay. I have like 10 of them. That I <laughs> That I I'll give you four thousand dollars for one. Like sitting in the drawer. <laughs> That's and yeah. So this thing's like, this thing's pretty cool. So how is that different from? Uh, man, I always have a brain fart when I think of uh, what's the primary lock nut system. The Whatever. you the Jag system. No, the just oh. the the uh, the the whole locking tuners with oh. the. I always yeah. have. A, uh, this is different. Um, this just sits like a stop bridge. You put the string right in the slots. It has this big spring here. 
Okay. And uh, that's what's different is like uh, those other ones, the springs are all in the back. Oh, okay. Underneath like a strat. Where mm-hmm. this, the spring sits on the top here. Wow, there's a lot it's of... Almost, it's almost like... There's a yeah. lot of movement there. You can go pretty far, it looks like. Do you, do you, pl- you play primarily... But it's sort of... It's kind of like a big... I was going like, to say, it's kind of like a Bigsby mixed with like a, a Strat kind of... It's got a really long, you know, bar... That's Sorry, a pretty anyway. guitar, man. What's that? No, it's a pretty guitar. Do you mostly play Rosewood next? Or... Sorry, I interrupted. No, no, it's cool. It's it's. I think it's the sound is is, is whacking out no. a little bit. You, I'm, I'm sorry. So you do you? Okay. I was gonna say, do you play primarily oh, dark yeah. dark wood next? No, no. There's a bunch of maple necks over there too. Oh, okay. I play both. Gotcha. I, I actually, I kind of like maple necks better. Oh, do you? Okay. <laughs> but, but all the guitars I've shown you. Yeah, they're all rosewood. rosewood. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't play maple for some reason. I like the rosewood or ebony. Uh, what's what's your favorite song you wrote? If you have one. Ah. Uh... I mean, I like the Hudson line was a great song that, uh, you know, that one I primarily wrote with Jonathan, but I wrote the words and stuff, but it's about a spiritual journey of leaving New York city and moving up here upstate. Mm. And that's kind of what the song is about. What album is that? I'm going to listen to that later. That, that's on Deserters. Yeah, oh, that's is? the one Gar- Garth Hudson plays. Oh, so right. There it goes. Right after Opus 40. Okay. Yeah. Um, favorite musicians you've enjoyed playing with? Nels Klein. <laughs> <laughs> uh, trying to think. I play with Joe Henry. You know Joe Henry? Yeah, why do I know? Joe Henry. Why do I know? Where's he from? He is married to Madonna's sister, and he made a bunch of records. I played live with him. Um, I'm trying to think. I played, I played with Bill Whitten in St. Johnny. I played with Ron Ward who was uh, in Speedball Baby. And uh, I'm forgetting a great one is Dean Wareham from uh, Galaxy 500 and Luna. Uh, Man, I didn't realize the scene was so like booming out in like Western New York. Oh yeah. That's pretty cool. Uh, What was the first record you ever purchased? First record, I think, was uh, Paul McCartney and the Wings uh, Band on the Run. Oh, cool. And the weird thing is, you know how it's like, I knew the song of Band on the Run, but then the beginning is like, it, you know how it's like in three sections? So I, I thought I bought the wrong record because at the beginning it's like, wah, 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 wah. and I didn't know that from the radio, I only knew the last part. So I'm like, I don't oh, know. The rain exploded. I, I think I got the wrong thing. And then after I listened to it, I, oh, this is cool. This is like three different songs smushed together. Yeah. This is great. Yeah, that's a great, it's a great song. Give me your top three Desert Island discs. It would be uh, maybe the Stooges Fun House and um, the Velvet Underground second record and miles davis in a silent way wow that's a twist uh uh, what was the robert quine was that his name yes he was a great guitar player man yeah he really uh i had steve hunter i had him on the show who did a lot who played uh Alice Cooper, he played with. And, and he Luke. also 
With Lou Reed, yeah. With Lou during like Rock and Roll Animal. Yeah, yeah. He was a really neat guy too, man. Really cool. Yeah. Uh, all right. Tell me, <laughs> what do you like most about yourself? What's that? What, what do you like most about yourself? About myself. Well, I like that I'm pretty easygoing. I can I can adapt to whatever is going to happen. You can you can throw me anything, and I'll I'll find a way to make it work. That's awesome, man. You are easygoing. Yeah, I couldn't see you not getting along with too many people, right? I get along with a lot of people. Yeah, there's right. some I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck them. <laughs> not many. <laughs> Uh, has your life been different than what you'd imagined? Uh, not really. I mean, I've played, I, I got to play music and travel. Like I've been, I've been to like 70 different countries. Wow. And, what's your favorite, uh, what's your favorite country, favorite place to travel? Oh my God. There's so many. I mean, I'm half Sicilian, so I like going to Italy. I love Spain. I love the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the Scandinavian countries. Um, I really love like Taiwan and Hong Kong. And Australia is great. I have a lot of, uh, actually, a lot of my family, my Italian family, my, my grandfather's brother, a lot of their family went to Australia and he came to America. So I have all these cousins in Australia. So when we go play there, like when we go to Melbourne and stuff, I have like these, they throw these dinners for me or all the Italians, you know, like, <laughs> that's cool, there's, man. There's like 60, you know, 60 people out and like just family dinner, like tons of food and stuff. It's like amazing. That's awesome. You know, interestingly enough, Poland is a great destination. Oh, yeah. Because it's like not, it's really beautiful, but it's not like going to Paris where it's, you know, right. 600 bucks a night to stay. Yeah, yeah. 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 I've, yeah. I've been to uh, Katowice in Poland. We played a festival there and it was beautiful. And then we played a show in Warsaw. Um, my family, the Makowiaks, were from Poznan. And mm -hmm. I have, I've never been there. So that's a thing. I got to go there. That's where Gilmore did his big concert. I think. In oh, did he? No, not Gilmore. Do you know a band? Uh, actually, I don't know. I can't believe I thought it was crippled black Phoenix. Have you ever heard of them? No. Nah. They're a, uh, kind of like, uh, harder shoegaze sort of band. And they have this great record out of posing on. Yeah. It was interesting. It's the cripple crippled black phoenix we gotta check that out great band holy shit yeah great wow. band. uh tell me the do you have any hobbies outside of music um i used to play soccer a bunch and i i still do a little bit like pick up games and stuff but yeah soccer was a thing actually that i don't know when i was playing like when I was a kid in the seventies and eighties, uh, everybody who played soccer were into music and stuff and they were punks and stuff. Oh, that's why we're in Western New York. So it was like this thing that was like, they were into music and, and soccer and stuff. Oh, that's pretty cool. Skateboard still a little bit. Two more questions. Cause I know you got to jump and thank you for everything. Uh, oh, yeah. No problem. Toughest decision you've ever had to make or most difficult thing you've had to do? Uh, difficult. I think, well, so my mother was living with us for the past eight years. She passed away last year. Uh, I'm sorry. She had, she had Alzheimer's and that was like, um, man, I'm sorry. It was very tough. She, my, me and my wife, I have a brother and a sister, but she, uh, my mother came to live with, with me and my wife. And it was just like, when somebody has Alzheimer's, it's like death by a thousand cuts. It's like every day, you know, 
Whereas my 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 dad had cancer and it was sad in it, but it, it sort of happened quick and there's this closure. There's somebody with like dementia or Alzheimer's, you're going through this really slow where they're losing their mind like over eight years or something. So it's that was like the toughest thing, yeah. Man, I'm so sorry. That's a long time. Usually it's like three and a half to four years. Yeah, yeah. It can oh. be like three to ten years usually depending like if they're young or yeah well i'm so sorry you had to deal with that man i'm sorry about losing your mom that's oh, thanks man that's a tough thing it's the circle of life yeah man no, last question grasshopper uh biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that has been intentional and how much is just a natural part of aging i think the patience uh when you have kids, you know, my oldest son, he's six and I have a four-year-old to have two sons. But yeah, that's like a big changer of, yeah. you know, uh, unselfishness and, um, you know, you have, you have somebody else you have to take care of and, and give everything, you know, give, not give up everything for, but you change you change your life that's why the the pandemic thing was easier for me because i used to go before i had kids i was like out all the time seeing shows doing stuff and then when i had the kids it slowed down a lot because i was just with them and watching them and stuff so then it wasn't as hard for me when the pandemic hit because i was like kind of like i had cut it down weight down anyways you know gotcha. other than than touring and stuff Whereas my brother doesn't have kids and he's like, oh my God, like I can't oh, go. Oh, there's nothing to do for him. Yeah. You can't you go got... out and go to the brewery and get like, you know, the latest IPA this week or whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, yeah. But with the kids, yeah, that's the definite thing is, you know, the patience and just see, I've always tried to retain that anyway, seeing stuff through a child's eyes but then when they're right there seeing it for the first time then that's like the reminder right there right daddy look at the moon the moon is looking at us yeah that's pretty cool that kind of stuff it really is. yes it is man uh i can't thank you enough let me tell people um where to find you first of all uh the band is mercury rev and uh go to mercuryrev.com they right now they are just putting out reissues of old classic mercury rev records on cherry red records also the harmony rockets is a spin-off group of the guys in mercury rev and there's reissues of those records too uh, on cd download and i think as well some vinyl but primarily uh some pretty cool box sets on cds and downloads so uh go to go there and check it out from a listening standpoint man you can't go wrong with, with deserters songs starting with deserters songs and all his dream like i said the first album I, I listened to top to bottom was great i mean from the first song chasing a beat a very sleepy river is really good record um these guys make really nice music. I, your covers are so fucking cool. Le, le, Lego my ego, man. That is such a great. <laughs> I mean, like nice. there's a lot. Yeah, that was just. To, who is it? Is that a? That looks like a famous person, actually. Which one? Lego Which one? my ego with where she's peeling her face off. Oh yeah, that I think that's an old. Uh, I forget where we licensed. That's been so many years. It's great. Where we, and then like the rabbit on snowflake midnight i mean there's oh, yeah. great covers man strange attractor i mean you guys are an awesome band uh also you could find grasshopper um on twitter at mercury rev is is his um what is it what is it? i'm not a big twitter guy what is it called though like your handle like your handle like we sound like we're like yeah. breaker one nine you know here's my handle <laughs> his handle, a bear in the air yeah his handle is, <laughs> is, is on twitter mercury rep man is there anything else that i could promote or that you'd like people to check out uh check it all out it's all out there check our old records on yeah spotify pandora whatever that 
Apple Music. I don't even know where you can get it anymore. I know. On, the, on the AM radio, man. I don't know. AM radio. <laughs> man, I can't uh, thank you very much for everything. You've been a real, real cool guy to talk with. Uh, you got that's such a you're like, I love your look, even, man. It's just like a, a like a the rock star vibe. It you know the rock star dad vibe. This is very cool, man. Uh, <laughs> but I'm certainly glad to connect with you. And please check out Mercury Rev. They're a great band. You can't go wrong. Really great melodies. These guys write great instru instrumental songs and great lyrics and everything, man. It's just they're on top of it. Uh, any final words of wisdom? Stay away from the COVID. Wear your mask. <laughs> Wear your mask. <laughs> you sounded like uh, I had someone on who uh, an Americana <laughs> artist. That was his last words, final words of wisdom. Anyway, uh, thanks, brother. I appreciate it. Hang on one second. Let me wrap this up. Thanks for Everybody, having me. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Grasshopper, also known as Sean Mac McCoyak. And uh, uh, check out Mercury Rev. They're a great band. Uh, most important, man, especially nowadays, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar and have fun. Till next time. Peace and love, everybody. I am out. Brother, thank you so much for everything. Peace.